Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the 2022 Living Landmarks Celebration. I'm Peg Breen, president of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. Living Landmarks are distinguished New Yorkers who help preserve the city in their own special ways. And we have a wonderful group of honorees this evening. But let's begin with a look at how the New York Landmarks Conservancy helps preserve the buildings and neighborhoods that are the heart and soul of this wonderful city. The Landmarks Conservancy has preserved and protected New York for almost 50 years. We helped New York recover in past emergencies, and we're doing our part to help the city's recovery now. Our grants and technical assistance helped buildings in Lower Manhattan damaged on 9-11. We saved the Survivor's Staircase at Ground Zero. It's now featured in the 9-11 Museum. After recent hurricanes and earlier superstorms, our emergency grants helped nonprofits repair damage and reopen. We've loaned and granted $60 million through the years, contributing to some $900 million in total restoration projects. Since the pandemic alone, we've loaned and granted $7 million to 147 homeowners and nonprofits throughout the boroughs. We're helping religious institutions in underserved communities with everything from conditions assessments to repairing roofs. Our loans are helping homeowners throughout the boroughs repair their buildings' exteriors. Callie Janoff received a loan for work on her Brooklyn Brownstone several years ago. She's been a friend and proponent ever since. You know, being a landlord in New York City is not for the faint of heart. Being a homeowner in New York City is also um, not for the faint of heart. And so it's really incredibly difficult to find people to trust. Janoff learned she could trust the Conservancy after our staff helped repair her stairs, restore the entryway, and even obtain a state homeowner tax credit for the work. I loved working with the team and we had such an incredible experience. It's like finding gold. Our Sacred Sites grants have helped more than 836 religious institutions of all denominations. We worked with Mother AME Zion Church in Harlem on a major roof repair. I am theologically and seminary trained. I know nothing about building repair. But thankfully, the Conservancy knows the people, put us in contact with the people to do what needed to be done here, and we could not have done that alone. The church is the oldest African-American church in the city. It's been a cultural as well as a religious center for the Harlem community. Thankfully, the Conservancy has been very interested to identify particularly vulnerable and historic landmarks in Harlem with the hope that the next generation will be able to enjoy these very important uh, jewels uh, of our community. Landmarks are important to communities throughout the city. Historic districts are drawing cards for tech companies, women and minority-owned businesses, they're attracting residents and tourists. As New York recovers, these historic areas will be economic drivers again. During these stressful times, the city's landmarks anchored us, reminding us that New York has come through difficult times before. We're proud to be the New York Landmarks Conservancy, and we'll continue to preserve the city we love. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our 2022 Living Landmarks. The best thing about New York is the Irish Repertory Theater. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we came here in, it was in 1994, and uh, this was a chemical warehouse. Charlotte Moore, and Kieran O'Reilly have a right to be proud. Irish Rep has won major awards, produced award-winning plays, and garnered a loyal audience since the two actors founded it 34 years ago. They were always confident in the Irish plays they would present. Well, my goodness, look at those Irish writers. 
I mean, you can name you can name ten or twelve of them just just like that, including American Irish Eugene O'Neill, and, and look at Brian Friel. And my goodness, when you come and see an Irish play, no matter what your background, no matter what your ethnicity, I think you can relate to it. Like any good play, it's not just Irish, but it can just travel. It travels well. The two also saw an advantage to being off Broadway, creating a permanent home on West 22nd Street. Off Broadway is the creative force, and so many of the shows, by the way, on Broadway have started off Broadway, or at least got conceived off Broadway and made their way uptown. But this is the place where, like, really true New Yorkers come to. Esther, <laughs> you're wonderful. When the pandemic closed the theater, Irish Rep drew national and international viewers with online productions. They had actors record themselves on cell phones from various locations. If you can find some place in your heart to forgive this most... I didn't meet me in St. Louis, I had a kiss. <laughs> we got very sophisticated after a while. And the, and the person, you know, they, they kissed and one was in New York and the other was in Baltimore. That's and, right. And they kissed. And they almost <laughs> met. Their lips almost met. Despite the difficulties of the past few years, they have no doubt about the city's future. There's just a resilience in this, in this city, and we've been around for, for quite some time, and there has been. You know, we were here during 9-11. You know, we were here during blackouts. Uh, you know, we, we, and we've been here during massive recessions. Where the, and you just keep on going, you know? You just say, you know, let's... Just do it. Well, New York, in the first place, didn't give up on us, so... Yeah. We wanted to return the favor. Both feel the city's historic architecture reflects its resilience and should be preserved. Unless you, you hold on to the things that make New York in the first place, like the historic districts like, like Greenwich Village and Soho and the Flatiron, I mean, that is the essence of New York. New York is coming back and being important and being true to itself right now. It's important to participate and give back because otherwise, what is the point? Marlene Hess has given back to the city in numerous ways. She directed philanthropic services at two major banks and created award-winning campaigns about community issues. She believes New York encourages philanthropy. I don't know of another city that approached it quite the way New York did. And I, the corporations here liked working with each other. They liked forming partnerships. So if you were doing this good work, the halo effect was, that's the bank for me, or that's the company for me. Their employees liked it. It was good for morale. Uh, the customers liked it. And frankly, it made you feel like a sturdy corporate citizen. Hess continued to give back with personal philanthropy serving on an array of cultural, educational, and health-related boards. I think that the cultural and educational institutions create the fabric, the bedrock of New York and lifestyle in New York, and they civilize us, and keeping them good and thriving and healthy is crucial to a good and vibrant and healthy New York. She's equally emphatic about the city's wide range of nonprofit organizations. I don't think New York could survive without its not-for-profits. I actually don't think America could survive without its not-for-profits. It is our way individuals get ideas of some way to address a social problem and get others to help do it. Hess enjoys walking in the city, discovering neighborhoods and architectural landmarks. I think it's crucial for us to save the best of our architectural heritage. It is what makes New York, New York. It's uh, very, very important to feel like you are in a city that has history and substance and tradition. Hess helped the business community's recovery efforts after 9-11, as New Yorkers pulled together. She thinks the isolation of the pandemic has made the current recovery more difficult but she's confident of the city's future. I'm very bullish on New York and really believe that we're gonna get through. It'll be different, but we're gonna get through and we're gonna get through it together.
born in 1930 in Harlem on 146th Street. And now my work is all over the world. The Guggenheim, the Tate, everywhere. Faith Ringgold is an award-winning painter, sculptor, teacher, activist, and author. A recent retrospective at the New Museum displayed her wide range of paintings, story quilts, and soft sculpture. Ringgold became known for her series called American People in the turbulent 1960s, depicting interactions between blacks and whites. Because imagery was exceedingly important. Were you going to have any white people in your painting? Or were you mm -hmm. going to have black people? What were you going to do? Well, I could actually do what I wanted because nobody's paying attention to me anyway. And that was very good in a sense, <laughs> that nobody was paying any attention to me. I didn't have anything to worry about. Her activism in the women's movement changed the New York art world. The museum will open up to African-American artists, but you won't be one of them because you're a woman. Okay, I got it. Ringgold responded by leading protests, demanding that 50% of artists in the Whitney Biennial be women artists. It felt like we were doing something and we were a part of the movement in America to equalize things. When Ringgold couldn't get her writing published, she began her story quilts. Her first, Aunt Jemima, turned the woman depicted on syrup bottles into a successful entrepreneur. Tar Beach was inspired by the Harlem rooftop of her childhood. It became the first of her 18 children's books, and it won over 20 awards. Throughout her long career, Ringgold has refused to let others define her. You can't sit around waiting for somebody else to say who you are. You need to write it and paint it and do it. That's where the art comes from. It's a visual image of who you are. That's the power of being an artist. I love the fact that New York doesn't care who you are. You know, New York, we're all equal in our own way. And uh, it's, you can't take anything for granted in New York. And it's bigger than all of us. Andrea Strakopoulos is co-president of the Stavros Niarchos Foundation. It aims to empower humanity and has made more than 5,000 grants in 135 countries. Our main theme is that if we see an application, a proposal uh, for funding, if we believe that it will add value to society and the people who, who run it are good, ethical, professional, efficient people, our job is why would we say no? The foundation has been generous to New York. It supported the transformation of the Mid-Manhattan Library. It is now named for the foundation. The foundation also works with Rockefeller University and with the Child Mind Institute on Mental Health Issues here and in Greece. Every family, all of us, have friends, family, whatever, or even our own selves that have to deal with issues that in the old days would, would just basically get on with it, or you're crazy. And there's a huge vacuum in between that we have to start being serious about it and help. Dracopolis is also generous with his personal time giving back through service on boards. Again, it's not only money that one can give, it's, uh, it's your time, your ideas to collaborate, and also we believe a lot in connecting the dots. So it's about meeting people with, with similar views, similar vision to try and help. So it's, uh, it's been an important part of my life. Dracopolis believes we all have a responsibility to give back to New York. You know, New York in a way lets you borrow it, and it's what you do with it while you're alive and to make sure, again, you leave it in a better shape for the next visitors. Growing up in Greece, Dracopolis was surrounded by architectural treasures. He's glad New York recognizes its landmarks as well. You have to respect where you, where you come from, whether you're an individual or a city, and thank you for all that you do. New York certainly re realizes that and tries to do it, and I think overall does a good job about it. Could we do more as a whole New York City? I think yes, but uh, the effort is there. Dracopolis also believes in New York's future. New York is back. It feels a bit different, but that's the beauty of New York. Again, New York 
basically lets you borrow it and you know it will always keep on evolving and after every crisis it will come back i mean when new york goes i worry about the whole planet so i hope we stay intact <laughs> I think of New York really as a city of immigrants. There have been waves and waves of immigrants, and New York has taken them in, and somehow they have found opportunity. Oscar Tang arrived in America from a war-torn China at the age of 11. He came to New York after graduate school and established a successful financial career. In turn, Tang has been an extraordinary philanthropist. As co-chairman of the New York Philharmonic, he helped lead the historic renovation of David Geffen Hall. He's also a longtime trustee of the Metropolitan Museum and chief benefactor of its Chinese collection. I am an Asian American, and Asian Americans are now some 6% of the population. So the fact that the Met showcases Asian art and culture is really part of the roots of this country now, and we should know that. More recently, Tang gave the Met its largest gift ever to help fund the renovation of the modern and contemporary wing. It will be renamed after Tang and his wife Agnes. Modern and contemporary, which might have been viewed as purely Western art, up until fairly recently, uh, now really needs to encompass arts from all over the world. Tang says his devotion to the city's cultural life stems from his experiences as a New Yorker. The way I look at it, a significant part of what I produce needs to go back into the community that supported me and made it possible for me to have a wonderful life. Because Tang has a worldview and has been in New York for decades, he is confident of the city's recovery. I came to New York in 1962, and from, for the first 20 years or so, the city was really in secular decline. So I saw New York perhaps at its worst. So I don't think relative to what I've seen for New York, I think this is something we will get over and, and uh, prosper again. I think the best thing about New York is that it's really a melting pot. And, um, you know, I'm from Philadelphia, and all my friends that I have here are from other places. But we've come together, we've meshed together, and, you know, we've, we've made what we call our New York. Earl Monroe made it his New York when he joined the Knicks in 1971 and helped create a championship team. He was a four-time NBA All-Star and voted one of the greatest players in NBA history. If I was to say anything is that I played the game, I played the game well, and I hope people liked it. People did like it. It was a time when players lived in the communities and mixed with the public. We rode on the subways to get to games. You know, people could come and we, they could touch us, which is a little bit different. And the thing in a nutshell is that we were also winning. After retiring from basketball, Monroe had success in business and entertainment. He won a Peabody for the critically acclaimed documentary, Black Magic. Well, when people watch Black Magic, I want them to understand that you know, it wasn't always like it is today. I went to a, a historically black institution because that's where most of the black guys went to school. And when I got into the NBA, it was a quota system. And those are the things that, you know, people don't even realize were going on at that time. The interviews and whatnot that we had in Black Magic with people who played during that time uh, really emphasizes those type of things that were going on and how we've transitioned from those things. Monroe believes history is important and that our older buildings reflect our history. Because if we learn what our history is like, we can also plot a course for our future. Absolutely, preservation is what it's all about. 
Monroe was always involved in education. A special charter school in the Bronx is named for him. The curriculum is designed around basketball to interest students in sports-related careers. The decor is designed to motivate them. If you look around, we have a lot of different uh, posters and, and sayings and whatnot from people who are pretty much, uh, you know, have made it, so to speak. But in terms of the things that they say, if these kids take them into heart, they know that they can do it too. And it's true, a ball <laughs> and a book can really change the world. We had hoped to honor Reverend Calvin Butts this evening, the longtime pastor of Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem. Unfortunately, Reverend Butts died just a few days before the gala, but we will still recognize his great contributions to New York. Reverend Calvin Butts was pastor of the legendary Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem for more than 30 years. The church itself is more than 200 years old and one of the most influential African-American churches in the country. Reverend Butts always believed that pastors should be involved in their communities. He was active in civil rights and social justice causes. He helped create a public school focused on learning and social change. He campaigned against tobacco and liquor advertising in Harlem and their impact on the health of Harlem residents. Abyssinian was central for vaccinations and health information during the pandemic. Reverend Butts founded the nonprofit Abyssinian Development Corporation in 1989. It has invested more than a billion dollars in housing and commercial development in Harlem. When he founded the corporation, he also challenged the city to repair the many city-owned Harlem buildings as well. We got to do something about this. We can no longer go under this kind of uh, pressure, our buildings deteriorating, the city owns all this property, you're not doing anything with it, you're waiting for the developers to come in and take it back. Along with his Abyssinian duties, Reverend Butts was president of the State University at Old Westbury for two decades, creating graduate programs and expanding campus facilities. After 9-11, Reverend Butts was a featured speaker at a special healing service at Yankee Stadium. Together, we will get through it because we are the United States of America. God bless America. The pastor's faith has inspired others for decades. It helped him as he faced his own serious illness. Even in the midst of his own difficulties, his message was always one of hope. So keep the faith and uh, don't give up because there is a brighter day ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I hope we can all keep Reverend Butts's message of hope in our hearts. We've all been through a lot the last couple of years, but New Yorkers have come through again. Thank you for being here, and thank you for honoring this wonderful city.